good evening and uh, namaskar everyone i'm anish pradhan and i'm the chairperson of the dr ashok da ranade memorial trust uh welcome to the 11th edition of our dr ashok da ranade memorial lecture series and i'd like to welcome today's speaker uh eminent playwright um poet author ramu ramnathan uh before before i go on uh to hand over the reins of this evening to our honorary secretary uh, anjum rajabali uh, eminent um, screenwriter uh, i'd just briefly like to mention uh, what the trust is all about um we set up this tr trust to perpetuate the legacy left behind by scholar musician and thinker uh, dr ashok da ranade and to encourage scholarship and performance in particular his work in the field of cultural musicology uh, which spanned uh, a number of areas like the the philosophy of music um music theory uh, ethnomusicology and several allied uh, disciplines um we wanted to focus on these areas uh as well as on the other arts uh which were close to his heart too uh the presence of cultural plurality and diversity in india and its reflection in the musical landscape of the country uh was a significant area of engagement uh for dr ranade in his writings and lectures and it is this idea of inclusiveness that we hope to preserve and propagate through the activities of the trust uh i'd like to briefly mention here that uh dr ranade's collection of books his writings um his lectures are very uh, carefully documented and cataloged at the uh, dr ashok da ranade uh, archive situated in pune uh please do uh, visit the archive um it's headed by dr chaitanya kunte also our trustee um and uh, shruti kunte and they will be uh, ever ready to help you uh, uh, resolve your queries um also please visit our website and our youtube channel uh, dr ashok da ranade memorial trust youtube channel uh, to listen to uh, all the previous lectures that we have done as well as uh, brief snippets of the seminar we did on film music a few years ago with that uh, i now invite uh, anjum rajabali um, to moderate the session thanks very much dr pradhan uh, welcome all of you again on behalf of the ashok da ranade memorial trust uh, there are four trustees here the chairperson is dr anish pradhan who you just heard then we have dr chaitanya kunte who you can see here he is a trustee of the trust and then we have mr john de souza who is doesn't seem to be visible but you can see the uh, there he is he is against the backdrop of the poster of the <laughs> lecture itself he is also our trustee and i am the honorary secretary uh, ramu ramanathan is somebody that we have been wanting to call for this talk for the last 2 years or so but for some reason or the other it didn't seem to work out and one of the reasons was his movements then covid and then connectivity issues but i had impressed upon him that as soon as he is able to he has to come in as our speaker there is a special reason for this of course because the spectrum of topics that we have tackled in the memorial lecture series were all those in which dr ranade had had a stellar contribution and was very closely engaged with and connected to in theater ramu and dr ranade were actually very close if 
it would not be wrong to say that despite the age difference between the two, Ramu was a personal friend of Dr. Banerjee and Dr. Banerjee as such. So there was a lot of mutual respect and affection which was shared between the two. Ramu will refer to Dr. Ranade and of course mention a couple of anecdotes which also are connected to the title of this lecture, Eight and a Half Reasons. And he will give you a context as to how it came about as a mutual joke between Dr. Ranade and him. But a little more about Ramu Ramanathan. He is most known as a playwright, of course, and his plays, Cotton 56, Polyester 84, Mahadevai, Comrade Kumkarn, The Diary of a Word, Jazz, and other been performed in multiple languages in India and abroad. Apart from that, he's also been a book writer. He's got three books to his credit, three Sakina Manzil, and other plays, which is a collection of eight plays totally, and two collections of poems, My Encounters with a Peacock, and To Sit on a Stone, and other shorts. Currently, he is working on his fourth book, which is based on his theater experiences in Mumbai, which of course all of us are keenly looking forward to reading. Apart from that, he's also a columnist writing for various newspapers on a regular basis. He's also co-edited two books, Book Binding with Adhesives and Babri Masjid, 25 years. As the editor of the magazines Print Week and What Packaging, I mean, which is really, there is a personal history behind that. And one of the people who are who's present here right now, Gauri Dange, shares a history with Ramu Ramanathan, and both of them were connected with the printing industry, if you please. And Ramu has tenaciously maintained his connection there, and in fact, done a lot of work in the industry, including continuing to be the editor of these two magazines for the last 30 years. He also says that in his free time, he cheers for Fulham Football Club. Okay, wonderful. A little bit about the lecture. Playwriting has always perhaps has had an optimistic attitude and Ramu emphasizes that. And there's a reason for that because there have been great obstacles in history, but with great optimism, hope, vigor, the great classics actually ooze with humanism and hope and at times even a war cry against times of oppression and injustice. At the turn of the 21st century, the playwright, unfortunately, today is huffing and puffing, unable to see much of what is transpiring or try to make sense. And yet, it is all the more important at this stage of our history that playwrights should be working with even more vigor. There is a good time, he says, to pause and consider eight and a half reasons why we need playwrights today. As I said, he will give you the context of why this figure. But he's going to look at playwrights and plays plus the cultural politics of the 21st century. And I'm sure he has very, very rich insights and analysis into this. Essentially, the topics are the questions that he aims to address in this talk is how to create art under repressive censoring regimes, which is what perhaps we are witnessing across the world, how to dodge those censorships and the bans, and in a sense, how to continue to dialogue with each other, opening up even more avenues for these. And then, after all, he believes that that is what playwrights have always do, done. They've created platforms by which they are able to dialogue with one another and at the same time ensure that there are who are citizens who are included in that dialogue. So without further ado, let us turn to what it is that we have gathered here for, which is to listen <laughs> to Ramu. Uh, a couple of um, words of caution. Number one, please make sure that all of us are on mute, including all of us. We will remain on mute because Ramu has assiduously prepared this talk and I would like it to go uninterrupted. It's about going to take one and a half hours or so. So it's full of substance and soaked in rich insights. And he also is a very, as I have had personal occasion to experience. So let's all be on mute and let's allow him the time and the platform to address all of us. Ramu, I invite you to please start. Thank you very much. So first and foremost, thank you, Anjum. Thank you, Dr. Pradhan. Thank you, trustees. Uh, uh, I know all, 
of your keynote speakers have said this that you know it's a big honor it's a huge honor and you know, words to that effect and i've seen that list it's a list of stalwarts um but uh, because of the sort of personal equation which you pointed out with dr ranade it truly is a huge honor to be you know doing this uh somewhere i feel the old man will be having a chuckle because he knew i was not very good at this public speaking thing and you know terrified so uh, he, i'm sure he's having a good laugh about this so interesting relationship with dr ranade um you know the astonishing thing was with some of the greats in maharashtra i never knew they were the greats till they exited so be it machindra kambli be it you know vinda karandikar be it uh, who uh, you know ramba pat sir gpd it's the day or two days subsequent to their exit from the planet that i realized you know how big their contribution was and how huge and one of the things that uh, you know i shared with dr anade was uh, a huge repository of really bad jokes uh, he was somebody who enjoyed puns uh, in all languages and uh, you know and the age difference i think somewhere got erased because of that uh, then he had this sort of um, uncanny thing of asking ankin uh, which would be in hindi or and something to that effect and you know one had to always have uh, a treasure trove of things to tell him about ki what is the latest that is happening in the world of theater in the world of literature what i'm reading where i traveled in those days i was sort of traveling through uttar pradesh i remember and so i would be returning and telling him stories um but i think my go to became a gentleman by the name of austin freeman for those of you who don't know he's a contemporary of arthur conan doyle and his thorn dike is on par to uh, sherlock holmes and um, uh, he's uh, again one of those detective science writers who used to investigate on the basis of uh, science i mean meticulous this thing this is the turn of the 19th century into the first half of the 20th century uh, and the clues were usually Uh, things which were derived from the laboratory of mr thorndike the detective so i had again uh, huge amounts of uh, data which i could share with dr anade things like uh, do you know the melting temperature of tungsten which is by the way is 3000 you know 422 celsius uh, do you know what is the melting temperature of platinum trivia like that and which he again enjoyed um so today's talk is basically again just a continuation of that thread of ankin or and is uh sharings uh, in his absence uh, for the last decade or so of what has happened and uh, keep, you know updating dr anade about what i have gone through or what my you know thoughts and ruminations are for the past decade or so uh, the reference to eight and a half is the felony film and as some of you are aware dr anade spent a considerable amount of his time at the ncpa and there was a screening i don't know whether it was part of a uh, you know film festival or it was a specific screening or a curated screening and it, in those days the vhs used to be the popular mode uh, and there was a technical glitch uh, as a result of which now i don't remember the exact detail but the audio was on and the subtitle was not on or the other way around or, but uh, basically there was a technical glitch and the film was being screened uh, you know in uh, uh, in the little theater there and dr anade's favorite joke was that for the first 15 20 minutes the cinema experts watched the felony film and you know uh, praised it to sky high without realizing that there was this technical glitch and this whole thing of you know our enforced notion about uh, art Uh, so what i'm going to do is really travel through eight and a half points through the next few minutes uh, maybe an hour or so rush through them the idea is again instead of making it just a sort of single point of discourse uh, share about eight and a half things that uh, you know one has gone through read and so on a lot of what i'm going to try to share with you is a related to plays play writing cultural politics and some contextualizing to theater um so that's broadly the background uh, the talk is a tribute to dr ranade it's uh, more or less to answer his question ankin and the third is there will be about eight and a half points which i will uh, sort of rush through uh, my opening gambit which is supposed to be my opening to the talk is uh, the most wonderful line by shakespeare in richard the third which is now is the winter of our discontent uh, and that's basically uh, what i start with uh, and that's one of the things i was able to do during the 
COVID pandemic, whatever, the last two and a half, three years is uh, read Shakespeare. Uh, so as you're familiar, I'm, I'm a theater person and to a large extent, whatever my um, um, association with Shakespeare has been on the stage, I've seen him on performed, I've seen films, etc. But the thing was, I realized I'd never read him. So I had this huge collection which belongs to my mother and I borrowed that and uh, um, read his plays in the chronology as he has written it, uh, play after play and it was meant and um, again, in lieu of some of the things that Anjum spoke about, when I finally read Richard III, um, I realized that this particular text is the most political play that I've ever read. People talk of Breck, people talk of Odette, people talk of, uh, you know, Badal Babu, etc. But this particular play by Shakespeare is probably the most, uh, you know, uh, important texts by Shakespeare and it is one of his early history plays. Um, so again, two, three reasons why I feel so. Number one is a play is never a play. Uh, so always keep that in mind. I mean, uh, a play is a sum total of multiple things. There's the offstage, there's subtext, there's the spoken, there's the unspoken, etc. And here again, I point out to something that Dr. Anade had, uh, you know, created uh, at the NCP. It was a, a little theater magazine called Facts and News. And uh, what it really did was looked at plays from the point of view of everything else that transpired, uh, you know, with the play production. So, for example, if he was talking of Gashi Ram, it would not be confined only to interviews with Tendulkar Saab and Jabbar, etc. But it would be uh, copious amounts of interviews with, you know, the assistant directors, the costume designer to someone who's coordinating rehearsals, etc. So as a result for uh, someone who did not a belong to the times or to someone who was not associated with, you know, the rumblings that were transpiring, the cost of tea to the rehearsal cost, to the running cost, etc. That entire mechanism unfolded in front of you. Uh, and the same thing happened. So it, it, it was a an important lesson for someone like me who was just starting out that how does one look at a piece of writing or any piece of you know theater? And basically what happens to a play uh, before a play is born? It's what in theater we call the pretext. Uh, and in that pretext, there are innumerable things that are transpiring. And what the playwright is ultimately doing is like the magician on stage with his, you know, uh, magic trick is he, he does that little aha act. And that is what we get dazzled by. But there is huge amounts of preparatory work that is transpiring prior to that. And that is precisely what Dr. Anade had taught us to, you know, uh, notice, uh, you know, before we get into the So what happened, what happens with Richard III? So again, in lieu and uh, keeping with the theme of the, you know, the talk eight and a half, there are eight and a half interesting things that are happening with Richard uh, III. Uh, All right. Uh, so firstly, keep in mind that we are talking about the most famous playwright uh, of all times. We are probably talking about the greatest. And if you're talking of the greatest, there are important lessons always to learn from it. The first thing that we learn from Shakespeare is his life is shrouded in mystery. We don't know who he is. We know very little about his personal life. And you will understand now in the you know next few minutes as to why, the, why this is so. Um, before Shakespeare was born, uh, England was the land of religious conflict. There was a clash. Uh, and you can see the shift, you know, from the Henrys to Mary to Elizabeth, Protestantism to Catholicity, then back to Protestantism, then back to Catholicity, and then back when Queen Elizabeth's reign of, you know, 40 years begins, is back to Protestantism. Okay. And uh, so that's what has happened. And during Queen Elizabeth's reign, this is the third thing, uh, three things happen. First and foremost, every single citizen uh, in the country has to be loyal to the queen, everything that she says, does, etc. The second thing is loyalty to the religion. And most important of all, erasure of everything from the past. So the Catholic past in England was totally and completely erased. So in principle, all this is fairly fine. But the problem for Mr. Shakespeare was his mother, whose name was Mary Arden, and who, as some of you might be aware, was a Catholic. Uh, and there are copious amounts of police records of Arden's. And uh, again, it's astonishing, uh, you know, with a little bit of digging, you realize the more brutal the state is, the more absolutist the state is, the more powerful and omnipotent the state is, the, the better 
the you know the police records are the more detailed the police records are and there are innumerable things of you know the ardens being spied on being harassed being uh, you know summoned uh, all kinds of things and then there's an interesting uh, set of events and again i won't go into the details but two of shakespeare's relatives one of whom who happens to be shakespeare's cousin charles somerville and edward arden are accused of treason again because of this catholic protestant clash uh finally they are arrested the police land up uh, they are arrested and taken to the tower in london they are tortured they are sentenced to death and then finally edward arden is killed uh, in the marketplace it's a hanging uh, very similar to what happens to uh, you know danton uh, 100 years ago uh, 100 years later and in the finest tradition of theater of cruelty it is the most uh you know the apotheosis of theater of the cruelty because it's not merely death by just killing or beheading somebody or hanging somebody first the limbs are maimed then the eyes are gouged then the internal organs are disassembled and as you know some one of the memoirs has written you are lucky if you die before all this happens and you can also see where shakespeare is borrowing some of the you know the gruesome metaphors of some of his later plays now keep in mind that at this point of time more or less shakespeare has decided that he is going to be a writer he is 19 uh he has seen this and what he has seen um he hasn't forgotten and he never forgot what he saw uh, the arrest the surveillances the killings the non stop being on the radar and so he makes a very conscious decision here is a person who as a playwright decides to live one life in public and a totally different existence in private uh again remember two things and again you can see the parallels that are there england is bitterly divided there are two sides very clearly society is totally schizophrenic um you know there are religious divides there are communal divides and everybody is keeping an eye on the other everybody in and around you is an informer the gentle and benevolent uh, queen elizabeth uh, has unleashed this police state there are surveillance maps which are created where you know there's data mapping uh every single catholic in england is being monitored every single catholic who's a sympathizer is you know uh, looked upon with suspicion and every single catholic is suspected uh, of being more loyal to the spiritual authority of the pope in the continent and every single catholic there is always you know innuendo there's always rhetoric that this particular catholic wants to overthrow the uh, queen and ultimately return to the old ways the old faith the old habits the old religion um uh, so what does shakespeare do uh he is obviously a survivor he is very street smart and he is also seen what he has seen in the last 19 years of his first 19 years of his life so he decides to join the protestant theater group so catholic who joins the protestant theater group it's called the queen's men uh and the plays that they perform are essentially propaganda tools for the queen and the empire and the state uh so basically a full of rhetorics uh, it's anti catholic rhetoric it's vulgar it's patriotic it's full of nationalism and basically it prepares the citizens and the country for war so again all of this sort of sounds for familiar uh, right and in all this turbulence in all this turmoil shakespeare spots an opportunity he does not sort of crumble under the pressure and say that it is going to be extremely difficult for me to be writing my plays etc uh instead he turns around what he sees as sort of overwhelming challenges and basically lives a double life so here is one of the greatest minds of you know uh, human civilization one of the greatest talents and he becomes a kind of a chameleon and he has to be he is surrounded even though he is you know with you know the best of people in the bars the brothels and you know the boulevards of uh, london but he knows he is surrounded at all times by spies informers informers double agents uh, you know and the police state he is on the radar and that's the time shakespeare unleashes his history plays uh and you know i would strongly strongly recommend each of you to read richard the uh, 3rd i mean i can you know go into great length and that can be a separate one hour where i go into each scene each sort of act of the play and you realize his true genius so to be a catholic keep all this in mind when you read this play and write a play like this and not be arrested for treason by the religious thought police so that's number 1 the second thing is to say what you say as a playwright and at the same time there is the veneer the surface of everything to save the soul 
uh, of a thousand year old medieval history. So he looks like he's, you know, holding up that entire ideal of the, uh, you know, Queen Elizabeth regime to dodge censorship of the state uh, to ensure that, you know, the theater group does not get a ban from the religious right. And, you know, it's a formidable group as it is, you know, uh, over here. And more importantly, to enforce the Queen's will. And then at the end of it, it's not as if he's written, a, you know, an experimental play, which is just going to have one show or two show. He writes the biggest box office blockbuster of all times. Uh, it's extraordinary. So he, he literally takes this entire text and, you know, turns it upside down and, uh, you know, basically to put it in, in today's lingo, he's the coolest cat in London at that time. Um, and uh, during the COVID months, one of the things I did, so while reading the play, of course, you know, all this hit me. And uh, as I said, I kind of doffed my hat uh, about a million times to Mr. Shakespeare. But then I thought, hey, is this just in my mind? Um, and then, you know, one read the play with a whole lot of very young people during COVID online. Uh, and two things emerged uh, after the text was read and, you know, the response from very young people who were probably the same age as Shakespeare when he wrote this particular text is number one is how Shakespeare is creating literature as a surrogate to religion. And that is an extraordinary thought. Uh, and if you know you flash forward, you realize that that is what the 20th century project was, that you had all these religious states and or feudal states, and you're toppling it with probably one of the best weapons in our armory, which is literature. And the second thing is what Shakespeare teaches us is the games that playwrights play, how authors mock authority and how they do it without authority, realizing how it should be done. And so this became a kind of a go-to play for me, for anyone who would come to me and say that, you know, tough times, turb turbulence, turmoil, my voice is in a minority of one. How do I sort of stand up to this omnipotent state, which is, you know, all seeing, all knowing and apparently invincible? Richard III Shakespeare. And, you know, as they say, when you have to learn your lessons, you learn it from the best. Uh, the third thing which emerged in all this was, uh, you know, again, it's a small theater game. I think all of us have played where you say, Imagine, uh, you know, someone who you know, who can play Richard III. And I think, for, if I'm not mistaken, 60 to 65 percent people said Vladimir Putin uh, would be the ideal candidate to play Richard III, you know. So again, uh, for those who say that here is something written 400 years ago, 500 years ago, you know, it, it's just that the parallels and the contemporaries were, are drawn. And again, extraordinary, uh, because again, on the cusp of the COVID when there was, uh, you know, and this, I'll just take a small detour, because again, it's it's a part of this entire, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of sharing that I'm trying to do is, uh, there's, a, there's an interview of uh, Putin, which is available on YouTube, and I would again request everyone to see it, just because it's just great theater. Uh, so this is an interview between Putin and the editor of the Financial Times, which, as you know, is, uh, you know, again, one of the sort of uh, iconic capitalistic newspapers originating in London. And uh, the news, the interview has been set for some time in the day. But Mr. Putin being Putin uh, keeps the Financial Times team and the editor waiting for hours. And finally, the interview transpires in midnight. So you're in the Kremlin. Putin arrives by this time, you know, you have 12 hours of waiting by the financial time crew team, whatever they are. And, uh, and then it's a show of Machiavellian strategy. Uh, the man sits there as a great diplomat, as a great uh, thinker, as a great sort of political scientist and speaks for an hour and a half, two hours, uh, about just about everything, diplomacy, uh, you know, he talks of China, the history of China, he goes back to two and a half thousand years. And if I did not tell you who this man is and, you know, what he represents, you would come away with the thought in your head that after Socrates, you're meeting probably the wisest man on the planet. Um, and this is how power functions. But in addition to, you know, what you see, there is two interesting things that uh, Mr. Putin says. One is, uh, he doesn't talk of the decline of democracy. And this is where he locates the conversation. He says it's the death of democracy. And he's saying this sometime in 2019. So one of the most powerful man, men on the planet saying very clearly that this is the death of what we understand as Western democracy to be. Uh, and I don't see any future for it. And the second is the retreat of humanism. 
and these are the two things which he clearly i mean it's a kind of a clarion call so shakespeare on this side and you can see what richard the third represents and putin um again just to continue this is going to be so we've just concluded with point one uh, of eight and a half another writer who i gobbled up again this was primarily because of what was happening in russia ukraine uh, was mikhail bulgakov primarily for his most marvelous book called the white guard which uh, you know uh, for those of you who are not familiar bulgakov is again uh, early 20th century he's from kiev he is a ukrainian not very fond of the red guards and the white guard is essentially a book which happens inside the household of a ukrainian family and like this protestant catholic shift you have a shift between the red guards and white guards in a very short period of 11 months and that's what the book is about the book is from the point of view of the inhabitants of that one little house in a very cramped claustrophobic kiev uh, urban household and you know the war is waging outside and a lot of what has happened 100 years later you actually get the best insights uh, into that you know reading white card anyway uh, bulgakov like shakespeare genius you know a man of you know wore multiple hats and um, coincidentally i came across uh, a biography that he had penned it's called the life of monsieur moliere and this was again a piece which he adopted uh, adapted for the stage and then was staged by the you know the, the premier group in uh moscow and so on now again um uh bulgakov does something similar to what uh, shakespeare is done you know 400 years ago shakespeare queen elizabeth bulgakov bolsheviks so again you can see the parallels but the more interesting thing is what bulgakov does with john baptiste pokalin who is aka moliere so i'll just read this out bulgakov was a satirist and dramatist moliere penned tartuffe and the misanthropy they both are writers who basically explore shortcomings of high and mighty folks and human folly but what makes both of them very interesting and here you understand what bulgakov is trying to do is they created art under repressive regimes again so bulgakov under the bolsheviks and moliere under uh, louis the 14th so this again meant that every single word that you wrote was uh being scrutinized uh you know was there were diktats where you had to actually rewrite copious amounts just because it offended one of the you know ministers or sidekicks in the in the darbar of the king uh but what was interesting was that king louis was moliere's patron and stalin was a fan of uh, bulgakov's work and when you read the biography you realize actually after you read the entire thing and then of course you pick dig out like shakespeare you dig out little nuggets about mr bulgakov you realize bulgakov is not talking about moliere at all he is talking about himself and he is talking about the times that he is inhabiting in and in a sense it's marvelous you find these two great writers are actually in dialogue with each other again because of paucity of time i'm not i won't be able to do this but there is this marvelous sketch in the book about moliere's funeral and what happens the last maybe um you know 15 pages of the biography and it's one of the most a poignant bits of writing it's a blockbuster film dying to be made and as i said you know there was a stage production there was an opera etc but what is most delightful is what bulgakov is doing with fact and fiction so at no point at at every page that you're turning you are wondering whether you are in in the times of louis the 14th or you are in the time of uh, you know uh, uh, moliere and you know how much of truth how much of lies and uh, you know how much of the biography is actually a, a, a testimony of history a testimony of truth and a, you know a memoir of another great writer or is it just a uh, a kind of subversion of this regime that you are talking so it's a constant battle mainly and the trick that bulgakov is using constantly is lies uh, and again you know we tend to always uh, have these notions about writers authors and you know we plonk them on pedestals and we call them you know the apotheosis of truth and all these you know wonderful adjectives but the fact of the matter is great writers are great liars and then it's a question of which cards you deal you know how how do you make your lies superior to that uh, you know the lies of the state because you're dealing with something which has a machinery and you know all of that 
and in my view what bulgakov is doing with this book and what moliere did with his plays is using lies and you realize that lies are the biggest armory in any good playwright's stock again you know i'm this might sound fanciful but again one of the playwrights i i read copiously during the covid was tennessee william i'm unfortunately not a very big fan of american playwrights and authors and so again i you know took a deep breath and read this and tennessee william is again uh, approximately early 20th century uh, he, one of the big themes that he's talking about is american individualism and the extremes to which it goes to and there's a play of his which i read called a cat on the hot tin roof and again you know when i see in production there are there is the movie versions etc and there are two things that emerged uh for me when i read the cat on the hot tin roof is i realized i've been reading the play wrong all along all through my you know last 45 years of my life and the genius of this particular play is that every single character on stage is lying to everybody else all the time uh so it's again it's not something which is you know rare it is something that is done uh constantly and like i said in addition to this trenchant criticism of american individualism and this sort of you know crumbling of american urban society everything that margaret brick uh, big daddy big mama etc everything that everybody says um, uh, to each other they are lying most of the time and uh, this was again a huge lesson for me that the greatest of playwrights um, lie and uh, the best of liars are the best of playwrights uh, again just to sort of conclude the bulgakov uh, you know uh, sort of episode um the day he died uh, as i mentioned there was affinity uh, between him and stalin uh, there's a call that comes to the bulgakov household and somebody picks up the phone and there's uh, someone on the other side of the line who says uh, i heard mikhail is dead she so says yes who is this uh, she so said uh, answer my question she so said uh, yes but uh, can you tell me who it is that's not important is he gone and then there's a silence and the person in the household says yes mikhail is dead and then the phone is cut and the person is left held, uh, you know holding the phone and according to a lot of people the person who made that call to the um, uh, bulgakov household was stalin himself you know so that was the kind of you know proximity and uh, you know uh, great writers who were thinking that uh, the importance of great authors in their sort of state and why they you know groomed them etc but more importantly the lesson that we learn from you know what bulgakov does with moliere is you know in addition to the lies this whole thing of cultural critique uh, plays are there as part of this whole ethos of cultural critique and if you know the famous adage that if the play is the thing uh, any good playwright uh, should know how to play with the thing you know and that's again why you have playwrights anyway so i come to point 3 uh it's football season and in a, i think in a few hours we watch the argentina croatia game uh i did a a delightful play in malayalam this was again uh you know probably the same age when i was uh, uh when shakespeare was writing richard or uh, you know thinking of writing richard the uh, third it's a play by um uh, tupatan it's called train to argentina it's a short 15 20 minutes skit and probably one of the most incredible pieces of theater uh that i you know come across and probably had the opportunity and honor to stage uh the play has a very simple premise it's an obscure sort of station in kerala um there are two individuals who get into the bogey it's a second class third class bogey uh person a is looking at person b and person b is looking at person a but more importantly they're looking at each other's objects and there is constantly an announcement on the railway station uh, railway station uh, megaphone saying that this train is uh, you know get into the train quickly because this train is en route to argentina and that's the bit of you know malayali genius in the sense of making a connection between kerala and argentina and there's some little trivia and banter and then what happens is this simultaneously as the announcement gets more and more absurd ridiculous what have you uh this um, game between these two individuals gets heightened and finally you have uh, everything that person b has comes to person a and everything that is with person you know and basically the props get swapped uh, whatever the properties are whether it's material etc etc 
Um, so that's uh, that's how the play concludes. And then even as the last sequence of the play comes again and fast forward, the game begins again with they're eyeing you know each other uh, again all over again. But now A is actually looking at his own stuff which he has stolen from B, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So again, a play which uh, in the true tra tradition of the theatre of the absurd and of course mixed with this mischievous Malayali genius uh, says many things. It talks about you know inflation and those days if you recall. All kinds of things are happening in Argentina. Anyway, the reason to share this anecdote is that uh, all too often we uh, our spectrum of looking at theater and you know so on is also pretty elite in the sense you know even the two examples that I've cited thus far Shakespeare, Moliere, Bulgakov, etc. comes from Central Europe or Europe to be. So again, uh, one was is very curious to know what is happening in other you know corners of the world uh, equivalent. I mean, what is the equivalent of me doing elsewhere? And again, thanks to COVID and this whole online, uh, uh, I met somebody called Raphael. Let me get the name right. Spregel, Spregel Bood. Uh, and again, what happened was an exchange of conversations with this gentleman who's basically a playwright who's see, uh, located in Buenos Aires. Uh, and I'm just going to read this because this is, a, a, you know, a playwright. And so he's pretty lucid about what he's talking about. Uh, so first I asked him what is the condition and state of playwrights in his country and he replies it's hard to say above all for me because I don't belong to the literary micro world of my city. Please understand Ramu that theatre author, theater authors are usually not considered writers but they are always considered theatre practitioners and therefore we do not participate in many of the literary debates and the uh, literary festivals that usually look like silly football matches. Uh, then I asked him about Borges because, uh, you know, I'm a huge fan of Borges and of course also Alberta Mangual. Uh, and uh, again, for those of you who are not familiar, he's probably one of the greatest living writers, uh, greatest writers of the 20th century who did not get the Nobel Prize. Uh, so again, uh, Rafael says that Borges always very valued by the Argentines, the Argentinians. He seems to represent some of our deepest feelings of university and failure. Uh, especially because of losing the Nobel Prize to Knus Thompson. Uh, and that was again because of political reason. And again, it's interesting for those of you who are interested in cultural politics, if you Google on Knus Thompson, you'll again realize where he comes from and what is the kind of anti Semitism and that sort of politics and you know what happened there. And then the crucial question about Borges and the upper class, uh, because again, this was part of the debate when you know people like Nabaroon and all these. Uh, you know, greats were writing in West Bengal and, you know, there was a kind of clarion call against uh, in the Badralo community about Tagore and, you know, the entire 19th century Bengali novelist. So again, Raphael says Borges belongs to the upper class and he might have been a little absent from the suffering of the Argentinian people, but he never actually participated in right wing expressions. And again, the fallibility of writers, you know, so far I've given you examples of Shakespeare, Bulgakov, etc. But uh, what Rafael says is that what condemned Borges was a trip to Chile, where he was honored by the dictator Pinochet. And Borges had always expressed that he only responded to the honors offered by the Chilean state. But we know what it means to take an invitation from Pinochet, one of the most brutal dictators of that time. And many other authors wouldn't have done so, uh, and so on. And uh, the fact of the matter is that there was a huge attack on Borges for his politics. But detractors could not obviously attack him for his uh, literary quality. Um, and then comes the question of his Borges and his po politics. And again, the reason I'm sharing this with you is the resonances. You find the parallels because you find some of our greats floundering like Borges and you wonder where to sort of place them in the context of cultural politics. It's not sort of easy world to you know, inhabit it. Uh, inhabit. And our politics is probably as chaotic, as unruly, as uh, you know, unfathomable as Argentinian politics. So the opposition, Rafael says, the opposition of Borges of the popular government of Peron definitely didn't help creating an image of him that could be associated to deep social changes. Borges is a myth, and this is the important thing, but he's a giant myth, and his writing seems infinite and inspiring. And despite all the political inscriptions of his work, he really put us on the map. Uh, and then again, uh, this was a question that I asked him about that there are two popular views about Buenos Aires. One says it's a city of old ghosts, another that it's a Latin American version of Alice in the Wonderland. Your view as a playwright, 
and he says i really don't know very well what the world thinks of our poor but very beloved city it was once a great cultural treasure but that culture seems to be in a retreat everywhere in this vast unkind world what is left is a facade of wannabes and ghosts as you say buenos aires remains a big social center as at least as compared to the other great uh, latin american megalopolis i couldn't conceive living anywhere else in south america but we are far from fulfilling the myth we have invented for our own city uh this buenos aires has always regarded every other city in the world with certain disdain and then this theme which i again spoke of argentina and europe because again we find parallels to that we have always looked up to europe and despised our own expressions uh this has made us portenos very much hated by other argentinians and with some justice i must say and but you must bear in mind that half the population of our country lives in buenos aires and its extended suburbs so that's a lot of people this makes buenos aires a city where many dreams come true and then most importantly theater in argentina and so in spite of all the odds in spite of a sort of crumbling economy in spite of having absolutely no cultural subsidy or art support etc uh theater in Arge argentina is a paradise for theater makers the independent scene is huge there are over 400 venues in the city and each of these 400 venues have an audience it is like what movies are to the indians but unlike bollywood our theater production is diverse and vast the state has little or no incidence on these cultural expressions nor does the commercial theater the big slice is the off screen etc and then he talks of radical expressions playwrights uh, you know who made an international career what kind of playwrights etc and then shares about uh, you know 50 names of 50 playwrights who we've never heard of and for me this became a very very important lesson that uh, you know we talk of this sort of global village and we talk of this world where we are all interconnected and yet uh, you know our ignorance about our fellow playwright in a fairly uh you know in a country which is fairly accessible to us uh is pretty dismal and then uh i ask him i think one other question uh which is about uh, my favorite theme which is revolutionary nationalism uh you know because of this whole thing of nation states being born in the 20th century and then of course the tone of what this uh, what is what does it mean to be national identity today and Argentina, again, for those of you who are not aware, is a proud nation with a very, very proud tradition. Uh, so again, to understand what is the kind of discourse which is happening and more importantly, what playwrights like Rafael and all his contemporaries are doing. Uh, so he says this is a huge topic in these days. We are a young nation. And his definition of young is we celebrated our 200th birthday in 2010. So what we are doing at the moment is reinventing our past, our tradition as we please. The truth is that most of our pride has no real fundament. This is a country that has been hit by capitalistic chicaneryism, criminal experiments, dictatorships of all kinds, neoliberal economic experiences that have led us to fall on our knees. We are as impoverished as any other poor country in South America, but all along we still maintain that mythical image of a glorious past, a great civilization that we have never ever had. So our identity is totally screwed. I don't think we have much to be proud of. We are as miserable as any other country. And this for me from a, another fellow playwright, I think was an important lesson. Uh, again, one to sort of ponder over. And again, for those of you who are interested, Raphael has you know, written a whole lot of plays. One is a play called Apatrida, which if I get the translation right, means stateless. So it's basically an historical issue. It's uh, He takes a uh, a slice from history in the year 1891 and it's basically the dialectics between a painter and an art critic uh, and what it means to create national art and then this debate gets like very strong and finally this uh, painter Schiaffino and Auzon they end up having this fight with swords um, and you know and in the uh, you know at the end of the whole thing this whole uh, debate of national art doesn't get resolved so that's what it sort of means uh, which brings me to point number four. Uh, so again, during uh, the CAA, uh, which is prior, you know, the CAA protests in Delhi, etc. Prior to COVID, I was tracking what was happening elsewhere. And again, I realized that because of what was happening on ground, uh, friends on social media and, you know, uh, the kind of uh, how the, um, you can say the arguments for being in a way manipulated, 
it became necessary for my own sort of sanity to understand things from a little distance. So again, like one tapped, you know, tapped is not the right word, but one spoke to Rafael and, you know, got a sense of perspective. Uh, there are friends in Ghana, Angola, Niger, etc., and Latin America. So, for instance, one of the things one followed for the citizenship battle was what was transpiring in Rwanda and, of course, Dominican Republic and Haiti. And again, for those of you who are not familiar, while we were in the midst of, you know, our own uh, turmoil with or turbulence with um, the CAA and what was transpiring on ground or in parliament, Dominican Republic was, you know, had deported thousands and thousands of migrants, mostly Haitians. And uh, again, it was all done in the name of this, you know, two words which all governments love, national security. Um, and there was this unrest and they were, you know, blamed that gang crimes, fuel blockades, etc. And everybody was transported to this island in Hispanolia. Uh, and again, through this strange sort of serendipity that sometimes happens, you're having conversations with fellow playwrights or, you know, fellow uh, thinkers or people who are in a way commentators in other corners of the world. And I chanced upon something that was happening, which had happened on 2nd October in 1968 in Mexico City. Uh, and this brings me to the other point. Uh, and there are eight and a half reasons about why 2nd October 1968 in Mexico City became very important. Because of A, like Shakespeare, like Bulgakov, I suddenly saw these sort of parallels and the wheels within wheels and you know, how the, uh, if you follow the money, you get the sense of really where the story begins. So for those of you who are not familiar, I've written a, I've written a play called Comrade Kumbhakarna, and uh, I suspect it's probably the most performed play of mine, translations, productions, etc. So my plan was to take this date of 2nd October 1968, and using a similar structure to Comrade Kumbhakarna, I uh, was planning to write a play about the youth movement of the 60s, again, resonating with what was happening in Delhi and prior to that. Uh, so everybody's heard of Paris, everybody's heard of London, everybody, uh, Berlin, everybody's heard of what happened in Vietnam. So what exactly happened in the plaza of the three cultures in Mexico City? So first, the actual action on 2nd October 1968, 10 days before the Summer Olympics was going to open in Mexico City, the government uh, and the forces and the military opened fire on a student pro protest in the capital's plaza. And the university students were held at gunpoint at the plaza and some, you know, hundreds and hundreds of students were killed. And as always, the, you know, the official media in Mexico published a figure of 27. Uh, so that's, keep this at the back of your mind, that it's all leading up to this particular act. So you can almost call it the Jallianwala of Mexico. All right. Um, now, what's interesting is that there were innumerable student movements that erupted in that year, 1968. Uh, and if you do a kind of, you know, make a grid chart and compare all the uh, student protest movements, the Mexican student movement was probably the most moderate, most well organized and probably the most serious. Uh, again, very, very interesting. They did not idolize Mao, Mao nor was the protest merely a counter uh, culture revolution. So this is the context that you need to keep in mind. Now, at, in the 60s, and I think for about two to three decades, Mexico was a single party, uh, was ruled by a single party. And there was this whole modicum of, you know, democracy, and but only one political party ruled. And uh, the abbreviation for that is PRI. And this PRI sp uh, spoke of revolution. But what is very, very interesting is we all hear this word called Kranti, revolution, etc. But this was the revolution of the status quo. This was the revolution of the corporates, all right? And the PRI was headed by a, a leader uh, who is considered himself to be the most kind-hearted authoritarian father figure of the country. He was someone who he felt had earned himself the right of being loved by each and every single Mexican city. And it was true, middle-class Mexicans loved him, uh, the corporate Mexican uh, loved him, and he was, you know, uh, their father. And the reason was, again, very, very simple. And you can, again, see parallels. Mexico was bullish. Mexico was prosperous. Uh, the GDP was, again, a very high single uh, digit. The exchange rate, the currency rates were very stable. I mean, these were things government people like to talk about, right? The economists praised the government. The government quoted these economists. So everyone was happy. Everybody was making money. And um, under this kind-hearted authoritarian figure, uh, you know, uh, basically, Mexico. 
cut to summer of 1968. Uh, keep in mind that this kind-hearted uh, authoritarian father figure has declared this Olympics. Mexico is going to host. For those of you following whatever was you know emitting out of uh, Doha and Qatar, some of the things will be parallel. So my play, which I have not written, uh, begins on 22nd July 1968. And basically what happens is that you have a clash between two gangs and they are the two sort of most, uh, you know, vicious rival gangs in the neighborhood of Mexico City. And uh, they come from what we call the boondocks of the city. And it's a, it's a big clash in the city. And obviously it's a public embarrassment because, you know, obviously the international media has started coming in. There is uh, dignitaries, etc. So the kind-hearted authoritarian figure wants to ensure that, you know, there's none of this nonsense that is happening and it's an accidental clash and there's nobody really to be blamed. But because of the Olympics, what could have been handled with some amount of dexterity, etc. by the, you know, uh, the, uh, the police, the response becomes very, very brutal. And while the clampdown is happening, a lot of these gang members escape. So it's a it's a clash that continues over a day or two. And it's the usual soda bottles, tube light bulbs, uh, you know, uh, the sort of uh, the guptis and so on. So the equivalent of that in Mexico. And when some of these gang members exit, uh, uh, follow the, please follow the track of, you know, the, the, the trail of events, they slip into the university campus buildings. So what happens next is the students who are essentially innocent bystanders, they get sucked into this orgy of violence. Uh, and then of course the police enters and the police anywhere in the world, especially, you know, as you're familiar in third world countries, um, uh, good behavior is generally not a priority. So what transpires is ugly. And immediately uh, on 26 July, a protest meeting is organized. It's a small protest meeting. Polytechnic students are involved because they are at the receiving end. Somewhere there's a whole spin given to this whole thing. Rightly, wrongly, I'm not, I mean, you know, it's something I'm reconstructing many decades later. I'm far away sitting here in Carwell. Uh, it gets linked to a pro-Castro rally. So the kind authoritarian father figure is very, very angry. Uh, you know, so imagine pressure. Uh, Mexico uh, is the sinusure of all attention. Olympics, uh, people are coming in, violence uh, and this nuisance which has come. So he does the kind authoritarian father does what all authoritarian regime leaders do, which is unleash ABC. So A is for army, B is for barricades, C is for curfew. This is like a known template. It has always happened. ABC is always unleashed. So on 30th July, the military barges into what is known as the National Preparatory School Number no. 1. And uh, for some strange reason, uh, even though the battle is with student, the army is armed with bazookas and such. Uh, now keep in mind, again, you'll see the parallels. The National Preparatory School Number no. 1 is the shrine of youth protest movement. And the poorest of poorest uh, in Mexico uh, study there and then subsequently go on to become either the you know major academics, the major intellectuals, the major civil servants, the major thought leaders of that country. So anyway, the future of Mexico is beaten up on 30th of July. Students are beaten with rifle baths and you know so on. On cue next two days, 90,000 students on the streets. Again, the parallels. Sympathy strikes all over and uh, 150 educational institutes join in this whole thing. Uh, so you have 150 educational, uh, uh, you know, institutes and their students on the one hand, and you have the authoritarian father figure on the other with the armed forces. Now, the problem is that with all major movements in the third world, the larger a movement becomes, the more unwieldy it is. Um, and so it happens. You have a few leaders and they say what, you know, leaders of uh, mass protest movements say that all dialogue with the government authorities will be held in public because they are familiar, as Bulgakov had pointed out to us, lies, lies and lies. So be familiar. Uh, the kind-hearted authoritarian father figure says, yes, okay, uh, but the deal is the Olympics have to transpire. Now, simultaneously, August, September, the movement is growing, repression, same thing that is happening with Queen Elizabeth's England, police state, clamp down, informers, spies, double agents, innuendos, etc. Now something interesting and these are the lessons that you know you when you're studying uh, cultural movements as someone like me tries to do is that uh, there are four or five patterns that have emerged from this. I mean there are there are innumerable as I said I'm still you know 10 steps removed from this whole 
uh, what transpired on the ground. So number one is that they, instead of marching in the traditional way, you know, with a sort of cry, they perform plays, they perform skits and they sing songs. So that's number one. Then instead of striking, the students do something what is called cultural subterfuge. They stage their, mo their moments of protest in front of national monuments. And when they do it in front of national monuments, they tell the history of that national monument and in a way reclaim. So there is again the official history and then there is the student history. The third thing that they do is that they use only Mexican heroes and Mexican symbols. So no Che Guevara, no, uh, you know, uh, uh, Martin Luther King. I mean, none of none of the, you know, international icons of the protest movement, only Mexican heroes and Mexican native symbols. Uh, then instead of protest, because that tends to put off the middle class and they wanted the middle class intellectuals, the academics, etc., to be participating in this entire, uh, you know, process they deploy carnival. So the whole thing becomes like, you know, the Brazilian experience or the Goa experience. It's fiesta. So it's a celebration. Now, all this is happening. It's growing. The momentum is building. Also, please understand Mexico as compared to India is a comparatively geographically a smaller nation. So, you know, uh, things that happen in one corner impact something else. So by now, the kind-hearted authoritarian father figure is very worried. And then one day for him, you know, he gets his moment of uh, sort of his breakthrough moment because they're trying to break the movement. As I told you, 150 educational institutes, et cetera, et cetera. One day, the Mexican national flag is torn during a rally. Uh, and that is enough. That is, that is the sort of chink in the armor that the, you know, the regime needs. And once that chink is found, all the students are labeled traitors. And immediately, you know, the machinery starts. Uh, the kind-hearted authoritarian father figure says this is an international uh, conspiracy and then arrests and more arrests and, you know, uh, and then it's D-Day, 2nd October 1968, the event which I told you that there is a gathering, army, etc. So, <clears throat> uh, so as I mentioned, I wanted to write this play uh, uh, and I wanted to use a similar form to Comrade Kumbhakarna. And I was planning to reconstruct this play based on whatever little. I mean, obviously, there's a lot more of material. There are characters, etc. But based on whatever I've just shared with you, the points. Uh, but as you're, as most of you are students of theater and you know, are, are keen sort of connoisseurs of the art, you will know that a play is not merely neta characters. A play is not merely the plot katha vastu. A play is not merely confined to its rasa siddhant. It's about the narrative. And what fascinated me most is the narrative. So this particular text of, um, you know, 2nd October 1968 had four narratives. And bear in mind that any play, even a sort of, you know, abysmal play, which you're not very fond of as a narrative, there is something that is lurking beneath the surface, which is dying, you know, to emerge. So the four narratives for this particular play was number one. There was a very strong uh, narrative that everything that was happening or had happened in the last three months in Mexico was because of the foreign hand. Cubans, communists, Trotskyite groups, and basically that they were deliberately spreading discontent. And uh, it is these groups that had funded the protest. So that was one very strong narrative. The second narrative was uh, a very strong involvement of the USA, CIA, FBI involvement in the entire affair. I mean, it was all masterminded right to a blueprint that every single day, hour by hour, Everybody knew what was going to happen. I mean, it was almost as if these are all actors and they had been given their cues and exit entries and everybody was going to, you know, enact their play. Then the third thing which was most revealing was that the kind-hearted authoritarian father figure was not really the person who was running the country, nor was his union cabinet ministers, nor was the military, but it was this contact that they had with US pro-consular authorities in the country. And subsequently, there are CIA documents, again, you know, one got access to that as well, which reveal this closeness. And again, you know, the briefings that were happening, including on 2nd October 1968. I mean, and that's how politics functions. You know, if you follow the money, you get the you get the clue, like our friend Thondal. And the fourth is how this whole thing has been kept a kind of a secret. And, you know, it has totally got erased from public memory. Uh, of course, Europe is not uh, interested beyond the point. And that most journalists, because one spoke to a few of them, are clueless about this. this we are talking of today's journalists, not back then. It's because 
the news beats and the media briefs uh, limited them to the official stats and government uh, you know facts uh, and that is all that they um, uh, that is all is the gospel truth for them so this is this is the total construct of a play that was never written now there are two asides when the curtain comes down there are two things that we got to know that when the kind hearted authoritarian father figure went to his grave he died or went to grave believing that every single mexican loved him that feeling never escaped that was number 1 and the second thing which was actually the reason why i wanted to write this play was that when one of the ministers in this particular ministry was asked why the students protested why the massacre happened why to date uh, nobody knows where hundreds of students are missing because they just disappeared and vanished into thin air this particular minister said in all seriousness the mini skirt is to blame uh you know attributing it to the corrupt influences of the western civilization and so on so this is the story uh it's the play the title for this play was going to be the plaza of the three cultures uh and it of course is you know like what the tiananmen square is in china or what our own you know battlegrounds were in the capital so i wanted to write the play again for a couple of reasons because as i said there's a narrative and there is always that shakespearean reason why you're doing things right um so for me the interesting thing was that this play in a way for us the 20th century was in a way culture toppling the old regimes you know religion uh, uh monarchy dictatorship etc and culture then became that strong foundation on which nation states with all these sort of you know with the constitution etc were empowered on for me this particular date 2nd october 1968 is the beginning of where i see the retreat of humanities uh from our colleges and from our campuses uh and again this is very very crucial because for art to thrive this retreat is you know makes the whole thing an impossibility and then you come to the present state where you know art then becomes commodified art then or culture becomes only an industry and everything else is forgotten so what you see is that universities no longer become what we call the center of dreaming the impossible dream of daring to ask that which we cannot ask uh and then so what is the role of a playwright in such circumstances is to champion the just cause uh is because usually the just cause is a lost cause right um and this plaza of the three cultures or what transpires there is the capitulation basically of political legitimacy and people's movements in front of uh what i call brute force and uh, the political uh, state and bullets um so why didn't i write the play uh, because like joseph k in the trial i know i'll be charged by unidentified informers informants for a crime unnamed perhaps uh and this brings me to another writer uh, i gobbled up during the pandemic and this is a small little thing for mainly for anju uh this is one of the writers i was reading uh, nelson algren and anju this is one for you to read at some point of time if you haven't um again as i said earlier that you know american writers is somebody from whom i have always kept a barge pole but nelson algren is someone i doff my hat to uh for 101 reasons and one of the reasons is that you know there is this whole gospel called the 10 commandments of literary criticism and what algren has done in his fiction non fiction writing has been that he has consciously ensured that he disproves all 10 commandments in his writing uh and that is pure genius um so again because i've been dishing the american regime and you know what they have uh their you know machiavellian manipulations in other nation states uh i came across this small little essay of uh, algren's book called nonconformity and it was published in 96 i think uh for those of you uh, so this was posthumously published algren died in 1981 and um, uh algren quotes this uh american uh humorist called jake uh, jake falstaff uh and this is a small little skit that falstaff creates in 1929 all right um so i'm just going to read this little bit hopefully this is a bit of a, a respite this is the book that i've been talking of uh, non conformity and again uh, uh, it's just a few pages um algren says uh, and again this is the voice of authorial sanity 
for if we have not as a nation gone psychotic how is it that we now honor most those whom we once despised and how a person who speaks the truth a professional perjurer is now called an informant we used to call them something else in our times blackmail in the name of anti communism is now dignified by the name of research services or national service though we always believed by and large in rugged individualism we didn't until now like the idea of dog eat dog if we don't what is the odious hulk of pat 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 mckern doing in the senate what is a man like mccarthy whose mentality never equipped him for anything more than dealing a three card rummy trick doing there never before in our history has a man so puny minded as jenner been dignified by the title of senator and then uh, uh, algren quotes jack falls uh, jack falls stuff who is you know like what uh, the equivalent of jack falls stuff the name is of course borrowed from shakespeare and that is the theatrical link is what jack falls stuff does with dialogue and his tradition is almost similar to what we have you know the stand up comedians of today the monty you know the monty python shows or what you guys see in <clears throat> in the comedy store etc uh and he uses the uh incident from alice in the wonderland with alice and it's you know one of the finest pieces of dialogue and i believe since today's session is about playwrights and dialogues it's interesting that i what one can do with dialogue and sub you know subvert the tradition so alice says i hope you will not be impatient with me i am really quite interested in this system and i would like to know more about it the white knight replies it's very sane and very human if you hate your neighbor as you love yourself you don't charge him with being a hateful person you call up the police and then you tell the police that his automobile is parked without a tail light that's how our system works only we carry it a step further our system today is so perfect dear alice that the tail light doesn't have to be not working it can be proved that it might go out that the tail light is potentially out oh alice says the whole system seems to be predicated on the word might go out might said the white knight solemnly makes right so if you charge a man with the crime he really committed your persecution is limited to one count but if you charge him with something else then you can use the entire book of statutes to choose from then alice replies yes of course doesn't it happen sometimes that a man gets free of everything the white knight says oh certainly but the system provides even for that by that time he has spent all his money on litigation his reputation is ruined and he has spent as much time in jail as he would have spent on the original charge anyhow alice says in utter bewilderment then am i to understand that most most of the people in jail are innocent the white knight says yes of course dear alice every one every one in the world my dear child is innocent of something also oh, that's false stuff uh so we live in this world unfortunately petitions uaps there's no escape and again uh i'll sort of because like i'm also keeping one corner of my eye on the time it's uh, 748 so i'll probably just rush to the end i again another master someone whom i admire deeply the great humanist vaslav havel uh it's going to be his uh, death anniversary uh, so he passed away for those of you uh, on 2011 uh, of 18th of december um <clears throat> and again one of the great protectors of the citadels of democracy for those of you not familiar uh he was part of the charter 77 uh, etc and like some of the people whom we've been discussing in prison for his thoughts and uh long amounts of you know solitary punishment and so on he then goes on to become you know plato's ideal of the philosopher poet who rules and he rules czechoslovakia and then when the partition happens and you know the czech uh, the czechoslovakian nation splits into two countries the czech, czech republic and slovakia he engineers what is called the velvet partition and again for those of us who are familiar with what happened in the subcontinent with the partition which was bloody brutal uh, gruesome and the you know memories of that past still haunt us uh, this was an almost painless partition that was engineered by vaslav havel so this is the man he's also of course among other things a great playwright and uh, an important writer and intellectual and again because of paucity of time uh, i'm not able to do that but uh, innumerable really hilarious anecdotes about him being the president and still wearing that bohemian hat that he wore 
and sneaking out of the presidential palace at 11 in the night in a two wheeler scooter and going to the bars of prague because you know if he did it as the president then there would be about 80 security guards with him so he couldn't do that and then of course getting smashed out of his brains and realizing the president of the country can't return drunk to the presidential palace uh, so goes to a friend's house you know where uh, where they have a guest house uh, guest room for him and he sneaks in and lives the night and simultaneously the state has gone into mental madness because the president has disappeared so you know and there are innumerable such entertaining things about him uh, so he um, uh, was part of the Czech uh, human rights movement, as I mentioned, the Charter 77. And in 79, after several years of harassment, detentions and surveillance, he was sentenced to four and a half years of hard labor for his involvement in this particular movement. Uh, so this is the context. And he is in a prison in uh, Hermenic. And this is a letter to his wife, Olga, uh, who is the polar opposite of Vaslav Havel, but a pragmatist and a practicalist in the true sense of the term and, you know, kept the house fire burning. Um, so again, interesting, uh, in this particular prison where Havel and of course some of the other uh, his colleagues were in prison, was a man who was the ruler of that prison. And he considered himself to be a self-professed admirer of Hitler. Uh, he was sadistic, he was frustrated, and he was at the end of his career. Um, and prior to this, he had also, uh, you know, commanded a Stalinist prison camp in the 50s. So again, you had, he was delighted because in walked in Mr. Havel, Mr. Distenbeer, Mr. Benda, and all of them are these, you know, the most notorious dissidents and enemies of the state. And for the warden, it became a return to the good old days of 1950 in prison, I mean, uh, a Stalinist prison camp, and he could do whatever he uh, wanted, basically torment them. Um, so Havel, uh, I mean, you know, it's a right, civil right of any prisoner, you can write letters home. So Havel wanted to write. And what this particular warden did was that he ensured that these letters were monitored. Uh, so letters home were one of his favorite targets, and they became the theater of a titanic battle between this man's vindictiveness and the wit and ingenuity of these prisoners. So Havel says, we were allowed to write um, one four-page letter home a week. And the rules were, the letter had to be legible. So if it was not legible, then they had to just throw it in the bin and start again. Nothing could be corrected. Nothing could be crossed out. Uh, there were strict rules about margins. There were stricter rules about graphics and uh, stylistic devices. So for example, even uh, in our own nation state, you are prohibited from using uh, quotation marks. You are prohibited from using underlines. You can't use foreign expressions, uh, French, Latin, uh, you know, uh, so on. Uh, you could only write about family matters. Now, humor was banned. So letters cannot have humors. Puns were thrown out of the window. And uh, punishment was serious business. So jokes were prohibited uh, because jokes undermine the gravity of the situation. Uh, so all letters necessarily, uh, whether it was during the colonial regime or the regime that followed that in our own subcontinent, you will find most letters are deadly serious. This is the reason. Okay. Uh, so Havel was the uh, target, favorite target of this particular abuse. And, um, um, uh, and, if, and you know, Havel, if you follow some footage of what he, uh, his persona was, he was this very sort of docile, very decent, very polite. Uh, you know, the epitome of this uh, uh, sort of well-mannered poet in a way. And so the guards thought that this is an easy target, a soft target. So you always find one such person in your custody and then you break that person down. But Havel was visibly at ease in the presence of such crude and threatening behavior and especially quiet and persistent refusal to back down. So they would confiscate letters in which there were too many thoughts. Um, What's this crap about the order of the spirit and uh, and the order of being? The warden would roll. The only order you have to worry about is the rules of prison order. Um, the only order that you have to worry about is prison order. So Havel could write a letter about something else. And um, when the warden told him he could write only about himself, uh, uh, Havel actually wrote a series of letters on prison moves prison mood one, prison mood two, prison mood three. So he was again mocking him. And when he reached prison mood eight, the warden said, no, no, uh, even this is prohibited. So you have seven unnumbered moods in this collection and uh, they are there. 
anyway uh, the reason why i'm sharing this with you is what pavel does what playwrights generally do and this is I, i'm because of paucity of time i'll probably conclude with this is that uh, he turned even letter writing into a game all right so not just have a even if you read the letters of uh, uh, dinsbier benda and so you have the censorship code but it was not clear enough and the way the censor interpreted it it was consequently they would read each other's letter and attempting to guess which ones would make it through and most interestingly uh, they discovered what was the order logic and the legal uh, spirit of the law behind this letter and the sheer pointlessness of it of course most importantly and they ensured how could they beat the system and that is what they did the letter so when you read this particular book which has got i think about uh, i don't remember the number now but uh, x number of letters to olga and sometimes she responds what you realize is that on the surface is a man writing letters to his wife but beneath the surface there are 101 things which are going on which are only sort of you know inferred to which are only indicated on um so um that is that i have two other points which i'll skip through one is i wanted to briefly talk about uh, you know the great zabo who is a wonderful filmmaker and based two of his films taking sides and mephisto on plays uh, because zabo is somebody who when i was a rookie at the indian express introduced me to a chinese play uh, by wu han called who hai rui dismissed an office and again because of paucity of time i'll probably run through that but again it's an important play because this particular play was probably the most important play of the 20th century and what it did, did in china and again how you know we are unaware of what happened so basically it's a play which he wrote for the who won wrote for the peking opera it's a play that talks about the peasants uh, then you have the gang of four which is very close to um uh, chairman mao in those days and he fancied himself there was a gentleman by the name of yao wenyuan who fancied himself to be the balzac of uh, you know what balzac was to napoleon um uh, mao was to yao won and he then wrote a review which was 10000 words of diatribe against this particular text and the review was so damning uh, that the beijing people's daily published it of course and there were many uh, you know drafts of all this this particular play review unleashed one of the greatest purges in human history uh, which is why people like me are always terrified of play reviews because you know they can unleash all kinds of things uh, but basically what happened was and i'll quote this is that um from january 1967 just a year prior to what happened in 1968 in mexico factories banks power plants were seized nationwide and the red guards and the army sought out everybody terrorized or simply killed everyone who agreed with the play or disagreed with the play review so that's broadly what happened and you know it was massive um cut to again i'm just skipping bits is uh, on the 21st century yao won he was the last of the gang of four who then you know were uh, much sort of pillaried in china uh, on 23rd of december 2005 when he was about 70 or so he dies what is very very interesting today is that in china nobody remembers yao won and of course that review but the play hai rui dismissed in office has been restored is studied as part of university curriculum and in the city of china the playwright has a statue in his uh, honor and this again for me is a very very important lesson that even in a nation state such as china with you know uh, you know 100 and million things which we don't know about that particular country politicians come and go politicians may survive but plays always survive um yep so i there's a lot more that i have which is mainly about german theater because i want i've done some amount of work on what is transpiring in germany uh, in the 21st century but uh, i think we'll conclude with that uh, i mean we'll skip that bit if there's anybody who's interested then maybe i can take that up offline um uh, i'll just end this with um, <clears throat> uh three sort this is the half of the eight and the half in a way <laughs> so the first is uh, i doff my hat to again one of the great writers of you know uh crime spy thrillers john le carre who passed away at the beginning of the covid and uh, again someone i greatly admired for tinker tailor soldier spy and you know innumerable of the george smiley series 
But there's something most important that Jean Lacare says, and that is that politics as to why we need writers, why we need playwrights, and why this cultural edifice is so important, which is the point I've been laboring over the past, whatever, uh, you know, uh, 90 minutes or so, is that politics thrives in chaos. And that's amply clear by whatever I've been trying to share so far. And writers provide lucidity, which is one of the reasons why, uh, you know, absolutists in regimes are afraid of authors. Uh, so always keep that in mind. There is that anarchy outside. There is that mayhem outside. And, you know, things can be at its disorderly best. And, you know, it's orders. It's, uh, it's authors who see the light at the end of the tunnel. They see that lucidity. That's number one. Uh, the second person to whom I want to doff my hat to is, uh, you know, he's not everyone's favorite child, but so be it is Salman Rushdie, who was um, um, attacked in August. And uh, again, there are two things that I did post that because that is all, you know, we can do is read every single thing that he wrote, uh, got together all the books that he had written, fiction, nonfiction, children, etc. So much so I went mental and attended all his talks on YouTube, uh, you know, just basically i felt this is just the best way uh, for a, you know a citizen protest uh, about what had happened to the man now again two things that ruzi says which of course again some of the things that i've dwelt upon in the past few minutes is uh, the world is comprised comprises of two types of people one is those who have a sense of humor and those who don't and the battle is constantly between these two groups unfortunately for us the the group with a sense of humor seems to be uh, uh, you know, comparatively less. The second thing that uh, Rushdie says in, in his talks, and I would, you know, again, implore you to uh, listen to Rushdie because there are two things he does in all his public talks. One is he he is refreshingly original in each of his talks and he does, just doesn't, ref, uh, you know, uh, repeat himself. Uh, and I think that's just, there is some, you know, um, some chip inside his brain cell, which just gets him to draw stuff from Persian literature to, uh, you know, Australian literature, and he's coping, uh, you know, quoting copiously from Proust, Balzac, I mean, you name it. So, I mean, it's an extraordinary intellectual feat. And you realize that ultimately, that is what we are paying our, you know, uh, we are doffing our hat to this sort of brain power. But the point that uh, Rushdie makes in one of his talks is as to why we need artists, is because artists are always one step ahead of the game. That's and that's always you know they're they're able to have the clairvoyance the foresight to be able to predict things. I mean not that we are soothsayers or you know we are prophecy masters etc. But that's what we do. And if you read something like Shame, not that he when he wrote Shame, that's what you know the intent was. But he predicts every single thing that was going to happen in Pakistan over the next ten years. Yeah? It's it's a huge achievement. And it's not just Mr. Rushdie, but there are a whole host of other things. Uh, and I finally conclude um, with the sort of permission of the house with, again, a great writer who I, you know, Im uh, immensely uh, admire. This is the great science fiction writer Stanislav Lem, uh, who is a child of Krakow uh, from Poland. And that's one of my gharanas. I believe, you know, like Dr. Pradhan has his gharana. Uh, writers have their own gharana. So my gharana is Krakow and some of the great Poets, literators, uh, minds have come from Krakow, Milosh, and uh, uh, you know Simborska, and of course um, Adam Zagorski, and you know Stanislav Lem and Rozek, and so on. Um, Stanislav Lem, I'll just read this because I think it's best to you know quote the masters when you're doing these things. Stanislav Lem, a prominent Polish writer, wrote a grotesque science fiction story which was set on a certain distant planet. Its inhabitants, otherwise completely human-like creatures, conform to a social system that forced everyone to live his or her life in water, preferably under the water. Bubbling sounds were the only acceptable means of communication. The official propaganda from the state emphasized the advantages of being wet. An occasional breathing above water was considered a grievous political offense. Almost everyone unfortunately had to do it from time to time. And of course, the whole population on that planet suffered from rheumatism and dreamed all the time about some dry place where they could live. But the propaganda from the government still maintained that the fish-like way of life, especially breathing underwater, was the highest ideal 
toward which every citizen should always be striving. So um, I can't help recalling that short story whenever I hear this word dissident. Does anyone who simply wants a breath of fresh air really deserve to be called a dissident? Should someone who simply can't live underwater, his human lungs not allowing him to do so, necessarily be described in that way? Suppose that one day the whole population of that fictional planet decided to live on dry ground and only the rulers, the propaganda police, uh, people and the police still prefer to stay in water and to bubble their absurd slogans, who would be a dissident then? As everybody knows, the uh, word dissident comes from the Latin dissidere, which means to sit apart. This has at least two connotations. Someone who sits apart behaves abnormally and opposes the behavior considered typical and normal, or he and other people like him constitute, uh, constitute a minority who sit apart from a supposedly much larger group. And both meanings have implied, uh, both sort of sets of uh, interpretation have two implied meanings. Yes. So I am done. Uh, thank you very much to everybody who's here. And thank you to the trustees. Thank you, John, Dr. Pradhan, uh, Anjum, and uh, Chaitan. Yeah. So, <laughs> Thank so, you very much, uh, Ramu. This was indeed overwhelming in the amount of substance that you have left us with and the information and knowledge that you have shared. I invite uh, Dr. Chaitanya Kunte uh, to perform his pleasurable duty of offering you a vote of thanks. But from my own side, personally, Ramu, since I'm the one who's been chasing you <laughs> for the last two years, uh, please accept my personal deep sense of gratitude for the effort that you have taken in preparing this and the amount of knowledge that you've compressed in less than, you threatened me with 88 minutes, but I think it didn't even exceed 75, I think. You know? <laughs> so I wish that you had continued with the additional 13 minutes, but be that as it may, thank you very much. There will be more occasions and we will be calling upon you to participate in initiatives that the trust takes. But for now, thank you very much. And over to Dr. Chaitanya Kunte, please. On behalf of Dr. Ashwadar Anadi Memorial Trust, I extend a very hearty vote of thanks to Ramu Ramnathan for gracing the 13th Dr. Ashwadar Anadi Memorial Lecture and delivering such uh, engaging and enlightening lecture on this online platform, I wish we have made uh, in uh, actual. This insightful presentation was an indeed an apt tribute to Dr. Ranade um, as he shared his some beautiful memories about Dr. Ranade in, in the beginning. I thank uh, Anjum Rajabali and Dr. Anish Pradhan for curating this lecture and Mr. John for providing the technical support and making this lecture possible in this virtual format. I also thank all viewers and theater enthusiasts who participated in this event and making it lively. Lastly, I hope uh, we all will meet next year for the 14th Dr. Ashok Dharanadi Memorial Lecture in live, vibrant and healthy environment. Thank you. Oh. Okay. I yeah. think people are closing off. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, just a word of information before you uh, log off. We do organize a lot of initiatives and we also welcome suggestions for, um, you know, with ideas 
as well as uh, by have to tell you that uh, while we are a modest organization and yet we do seek to encourage research in any of these fields that dr ranade was involved in including music literature theater cinema etc so if you do have uh, any proposals if you are looking for perhaps any kind of association or engagement with the trust's activities or if you have ideas about what else that the trust could be doing please feel free to write us for now you can use my email id johnny if you will just put it in the chat uh, it's my full name anjumrajavali@gmail.com so we would be happy to uh, receive those proposals and those ideas and we can inform you about in much fuller detail about what the trust is doing and planning to do so perhaps there can be far more uh, interaction and engagement between you people and us